Hello and welcome. Ooh. Right. Oh, uh, sorry uh, we didn't get you to it last night, but we're back on target. So I've got uh, an interesting session uh, planned for you tonight. Quite a lot of technical stuff going on. So um, first off, you may see uh, behind me, well, this is a picture of Evil Knievel. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, who haven't done their homework, that Evil Knievel was the guy who popularized uh, positive mental attitude. So he did go on uh, on about it quite a lot just before jumping over a various number of uh, buses um, and, and crashing quite a lot on his motorbike. But he said um, uh, that you don't fail when you fall off, you fail when you don't get up again. So he went on about positive mental attitude. And that's quite uh, quite good for us because uh, let's have a look at my words. Sorry. Oh. So, um, we have looked at uh, meaningful practice. We were moved on to failure, um, and then we came back to feedback. So, um, meaningful practice is how we're going to progress. We're not going to progress without meaningful practice. Just just swimming up and down a pool is not meaningful. There's no uh, there's no f possibly possibility of failure. So uh, that's not going to be meaningful. And um, with failure comes the possibility of, of feedback. Now with feedback, you've got to be honest with the feedback. You've got to be honest that you've, when you haven't made it, you've got to be honest when you when you failed. And this honesty is, although we tell our buddies and we have these outward um, uh, ideas, the real thing is um, that um, we take them on ourselves. We internalize them. Okay, and also the internalization of the skills. So I've, I've not drawn my big arrow. I'm gonna. I'll get Kerry to do that later. She can. She's quite arty. She can do a nice uh, link between honesty and uh, internalization. But tonight I want to look at challenge. Okay, so it's quite interesting. Challenge of failure. I know when he drew this up, uh, just randomly put these on the board, and challenge and failure next to each other. So challenge is what we're going to look at tonight or I'm going to talk about tonight. So um, you've got to understand the concept of a challenge. Just saying I'm going to swim uh, 100 meters dynamic is not a challenge. That's uh, an aim, an objective, a goal maybe, but it's not a challenge. Um, unless, of course, you're swimming um, 90 meters uh, dynamic. A challenge is something that you can set for yourself that you probably can't do um, but you're not too far away from doing so uh, all the no tanks exercises all the 42 exercises we have um, have this idea of a, a challenge level that you can set yourself a challenge and you can't do it the idea is you can't do it yet and as you move uh, forward you 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 almost touch it oh, next time I can do it next time I can do it which has three major important uh, reasons why 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 it helps us the first is uh, that we can actually see something uh, that's close enough that it's not like in two years time it's it's next time we do this exercise we've got it and that's that's uh, really important for our motivation but the other thing is uh, that when we look back we we can see that we've improved so we couldn't do something we couldn't do it we couldn't do it we couldn't do it we could do it all right so we can look back and you can see that improvement and this is um uh, how our minds work and in the western world uh, especially where we are run by money you see a lot of um artistic um or interpretational um activities they really have feel that they have to grade them um, the, the old adage is that uh, in jiu-jitsu there was or judo going back before jiu-jitsu there was there's only two belts there's a white belt and it got darker as it got dirtier and then and then became a black belt um, but 
in the Western world, we've got all these coloured belts in the middle, same with karate and uh, karate, <laughs> same as karate and, um, you know, jiu-jitsu. Uh, and jiu-jitsu is obviously close to my heart, if you don't know that already. But it's more pertinent because it's quite a new um, developed uh, martial art in, in, in the structural sense. And you, in the old schools, you just have four coloured belts. But when it's come over to the Western world, they put stripes on. So white belt, one stripe, two stripe, three stripe, four stripe. And then you go on to blue belt. And you have these increments uh, that we can understand. And in the Western world, we do that for money. So we want to keep people motivated. It's, oh, I've got another stripe. I've got another stripe. And the stripes don't mean anything specific except that you're moving forwards. So it's a way of giving your instructor giving you feedback in it, that you have progressed. Now, in freediving, um, if you concentrate on numbers, then as some people do, and they have their teaching structure around numbers, then you go a bit deeper, you, you get another level, you get another certificate, you get another a, a course signed off or something. But that doesn't really show that you as a person have developed. Um, you, you really want to know that you have developed uh, I said something to somebody the other day that if you can't swim, um, if you can't swim a length underwater, there's two paths you can take. The first path is that uh, you put a neck weight on and try and keep them under. And if they still can't swim a length, then you put a monofin on. And if they cool, still can't swim a length, put a glide on a much better fin, works much better, still can't swim a length, then you put a super smooth skin and then they hit the length, they've done their length underwater. Whoa. Have they improved as a diver? No. They've just improved their equipment. The other path is that you just keep swimming and keep swimming and eventually you'll get that length underwater. And I don't mean you're not on the surface, I mean controlled underwater, you get the whole length. And in the second case where it's a much longer way of doing it, uh, the actual personal development is, is a lot more, well, no, there is personal development as opposed to just equipment, equip, equipmental development. So we really want to take that attitude with our training and we set our own challenges. Now, um, I've got to mention now that no tanks have their color grades and our color grades aren't based on numbers they're based on people's understanding of themselves uh, their awareness of themselves and their understanding of the no tank style so the yellow everybody turns up as a yellow uh, it was meant to be white uh, but back in the day when we set them up uh, we'd given out some white rash vests or something uh, so we went, oh, well, the yellows are going to be our white belts. <laughs> so yellow rash vest is where you start. And that just means uh, that you're new to it and you don't really uh, know all the games or all the exercises or, or anything. So when you've learned the exercises, when you've learned the most of the exercises out, the 42 exercises, and you know physically what each one is, then you progress on to blue. Um, when you've learned... Um, why we do the exercises then you go on to the red which means you're a senior senior so you have uh the intermediates and the blues asking the seniors well how can i tweak this f f for me to, to to get better i, I you know, i'm finding this a little bit easier easy now can can how do i tweak it what's the point of the exercise the, the second and third and fourth levels of the exercise uh, and of course the person on the side who's wearing a black rash vest and that just denotes that they're uh, the person who's running the session nominally at the instructor but of course they just uh, it, it's more uh, the respect of them uh, in charge of the exercises okay so that's that's um, that's just a little bit of history behind the no tank system um, so uh, on our on our board we have we have challenge now you've got to know these challenges okay so uh, the yellows the challenge for them is just joining in the exercises just knowing that there's a reason why we're doing it um, that is enough but what are we doing uh, you know who's got the torpedo who's going to be swimming at what point so that's the challenge for the yellows to learn what the heck's going on and of course their freediving is going to be improving 
just by doing the exercises, just by uh, you know, kind of joining in. And of course, their awareness of what's going on is going to improve all the time. Then when you get to blue, uh, so you know what the exercises are, the challenges are slightly more diverse because you, you've got to explain what's going on to the yellows. The yellows are there, not knowing what to do, and you're a blue. So you've got to be telling them, oh, you can, you've got to swim now, you've got to swim now. And quite quickly you'll realise, I don't know why you've meant to swim now, but that's when you're meant to swim. Standard warm-up, for instance, you start at a shallow end, you swim on the surface. As soon as you touch the wall, the next person starts swimming on the surface. And the blue should be telling the yellows that. No, hang on, hang on, hang on, wait until they've touched the wall. Bam. Unless you're a big group, if you've got five in the in the group or six, then you can go a little bit earlier, like uh, the, uh, the second set of flags, but no earlier than that. And this is the job of the blues, to know when people should be going. The reds, however, are one step ahead. They should be known, their challenge is to work out how to make things harder, how to make things easier. So, for, in, for instance, in uh, torpedo uh, doubles, if you've got five people in a group in torpedo doubles, you have... Uh, two people uh, waiting at the shallow end and only one person waiting at the deep end and that person's going to get a much m harder workout and that's the job of the Reds to work out be aware of who you've got in the, in the, in the group and say okay uh, you go down the deep end on your own you, you, you're going to have to turn around a lot quicker than the two people down this end who um, are breathing up okay uh, you know, in turn, so they get a longer. So that's the job of the Reds to know what's going on. And that's the challenge for them. To And, and they will get it wrong, and everybody will get it wrong. The Reds will send two people down the deep end, one person down the shallow end, or they'll send you know, a, a slightly newer person down the deep end on their own, and they get a harder harder session. Um, and that that's that's where it comes back to the feedback. Oh, I realise now that I shouldn't have done that. You failed. doesn't matter. doesn't affect anything, except... That you're honest with it you internalize that that kind of mistake and you don't do it again that's where your improvement is and that's how we grade our people uh, our members are on their understanding rather than on their uh, you know numbers rather than the distances they swim okay so um another thing that people have been asking about no tanks so i'm going to go through this briefly uh, now before going on to the no tanks uh, word or aspect should I say and um, I'm going to go through candle blows and why we do them how they fit in there is a PDF so if you want uh, to copy of the PDF uh, just uh, um, send a message over in uh, messenger I haven't been responding to messages for a couple of days I'm sorry but I will be getting around to it so I know there's a couple of people asking questions uh, over the last couple of days, I'll get onto it tomorrow. Sorry. But anyway, I can send out the candle blows to you uh, tomorrow, but we're going to go through them now. So, there are actually seven reasons why we uh, do the candle blows, and most people um, will understand the first two because we mention them quite a lot. Um, you might even understand the, the third, the, the first three, because they're fairly. Uh, obvious okay so what are the candle blows let's let's uh, let's de define them okay they're strong di three strong diaphragmatic breaths okay directly preceding uh, a breath hold okay so uh, they're a soft inhalation and then a forced exhalation through pursed lips so uh, let's let's do this not in a microphone <laughs> So I'm breathing in with a diaphragm and blowing out. So there's three of them. Uh, why is there three of them? Well, um, that pretty much within three breaths, you can oxygenate most of the body's blood, the blood, uh, the blood in the body. You can oxygenate it. So if you do three candle blows, you're pretty much oxygenating all the blood in your body. Not all of it, but a, a fair percentage. So we do three because... Uh, we can do that before any dive, and we teach this to stunt uh, people um, as as part of their breathe up. So they might be standing around for quite a while, then they shout action. They've got five seconds, which is roughly how long it takes to do candle blows. Three candle blows. They've oxygenated their body, their blood, and then they do the stunt. The same as us. If we're in a rescue scenario, you're not not uh, particularly um, breathed up for a dive. It's an emergency. 
you've got time five seconds to do the candle blows which oxygenates or, 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 your, or your, your body or most of it and that even means if you've been doing a long swim and you've got high carbon dioxide and you've got low oxygen and you you know you, you're pretty knackered and then you've got to go again three candle blows you will oxygenate the, the, the body uh, okay which is going to reduce the uh, likelihood of blackout by quite a significant amount so um, the first reason that we teach is communication, okay, and that's communication to everybody around you. Um, when you've been laying on the side of a pool or hanging on a boil or a rope uh, and you're just about to dive, you want to tell everybody around you, I'm about to dive. And there are two ways of doing this. The first is just to go, kind of, hey, Fred, I'm about to dive. Will you watch me? Or we have a signal, a non-verbal communication that says, I am about to dive. Um, and that's the candle blows. So you can be on the rope, you can keep your eyes shut, so you just keep your uh, you know, heart rate low and your meditative state in a good order and you just blow the candles. And if you ever go in open water with uh, two or three instructors, it's quite interesting to see um, if, if we're on a, on, a, on a pontoon or there's like two or three instructors around, you'll see somebody blows the candles, all the instructors will look around. Oh yeah, no, it's okay, they've got a buddy. Oh, they are, they've got a buddy. Uh, and all the instructors because it's just so easy just to kind of look around and just make sure somebody's okay so the candle blows communication to everybody around you but the second one is communication to yourself okay um it's it's a little bit um it's a positive conditional hook triggering the dive responses okay so we've got lots of dive responses in the body and we can trigger them before the dive Okay, based on classical conditioning, um, you know, Pavlov uh, in 1904, 1904, somebody will correct me, uh, who showed that you can condition um, dogs, Pavlov's dogs, um, and you can, you can condition reflect, uh, re reflexive processes, and you can condition them to come uh, when, you know, uh, or, or with a with a stimulus and so we make use of this so every time you blow the candles you hold your breath your body knows you're going to hold your breath and it can the, uh, trigger the dive responses and it is incredible how powerful it is and it's incredible how quick it is uh, and i'll explain uh, later how we know it works um, um, specifically but quite quickly when you've been doing the correct training you, as soon as you blow the candles you can feel the vasoconstriction you can feel the blood uh, shunt to the core you can feel the heart rate dropping just by doing the candle blows which is incredible uh, that you can have that control before a dive so it's super super powerful um the other uh, so that's uh, the first two reasons uh, the third reason is very, very simple. If you've been sitting on the side of the pool, if you've been sitting on a buoy or laying on your back or however you want to breathe up and you've been breathing really slowly for five in, ten out, somebody's breaths, they could take a minute. Okay? So you may find some of the air you've got in your lungs, in your residual volume, that's been in, your, in there for like a minute. You've already effectively been using that air for a minute. That air is one minute into its breath hold. So you want to clear that out. You want to clear that out, all right? So, and this is why we don't use a snorkel, because when you do a snorkel, it increases the residual volume of air. The, the air in your mouth and the air in the snorkel never gets refreshed. So you, you breathe out, maybe a nice long breath. The air you've had in your, in your lungs goes into the mouth, into the, into the snorkel, the last bit you breathed out. That air you've been using for a minute, it's already a minute into its breath hold, and then you suck it straight in the, in the snorkel, in the mouth, and into the lungs. But with the candle blows, the residual, it, it's something crazy, like nearly doubles the amount of residual volume you've got with a snorkel because of the mouth and the snorkel as well. Whereas if we uh, just candle blows without a snorkel, we can refresh the air we've got in our mouth as well. So that stale air, we want to refresh it. Now, if you just blow the air out gently, 
you're not really mixing up the air deep in your lungs. You're not kind of uh, stirring it up to refresh it out. So these are forceful, diaphragmatic, so it's not using the, the chest, it's using the diaphragm to really squeeze out that air, suck in fresh air, squeeze out, so we're refreshing the air we have in the lungs. Okay, so they're the three main reasons that we uh, tell people. Okay, but um, we also have um, other interesting uh, reasons which I'm going to kind of go into. We don't usually go into them, I'm going to go into them now. Um, so, alveoli, the last bit of your lungs, they have quite a lot of CO2 in them. Usually, they're about four or five percent. Okay. And if you breathe slowly, this can raise to maybe six and a half percent. Okay, so there's there's quite quite a lot of uh, high CO2 in the alveoli. Okay, so um, we really don't want it six and a half. We really want it kind of more four. And healthy is between four and five percent, which is most people don't realize this most people don't know it because the air we breathe out doesn't have that sort of percentage but in the alveoli itself so um as we breathe just forcibly for three breaths it can just lower it back down to a normal amount okay um so that's that's number where we're up to I've, i'm going to keep my fingers up here so i don't lose count number four number five Okay, as we force, and it has to be forced, so people can hear it. Okay, but it's usually also equally well as we force uh, the the lungs, squeeze the lungs from the outside, the blood around the lungs. Okay, which is refreshing the oxygen. Okay, is squeezed out, so the heart doesn't have to go uh, as high to uh, circulate as much blood as it does. So we can squeeze the blood used from the outside so that's that's why that's why it's quite quite good that's number five okay now number six a little bit um how can i say maybe a little bit harder to explain okay so if you're laying flat on the surface of the water and you just do a duck dive the body demands oxygen it demands the heart rate to go up okay and the heart rate will go up. So maybe, and I'm just making these numbers up, you're laying on the surface, the heart rate's maybe 40, all right? And you do a duck dive, your body demands the heart to go up. So the heart rate peaks, okay, maybe 70, 80, all right? As you do your duck dive, and then your body is ready, ready for action. So it keeps the heart rate quite high. So it takes quite a lot of time for it to drop from that 70, 80 heartbeats. Uh, it takes quite a long time to drop down to the 40 that you started with okay with the candle blows your heart rate artificially goes up so you're laying on the surface you blow the candle blows and the heart rate goes up before you do the duck dive so the heart rate goes up to say uh, you know 70 80 okay but it peaks just as you're doing the duck dive your body hasn't demanded the heart rate to go up just you've made it going up by by blowing the candles by this 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 action so when you start swimming down the heart rate will drop a lot quicker because you haven't demanded the heart rate to go up so you'll find that the heart rate drops back to that 40 that you want that you started with a lot quicker with the candle blows than without because the body's not ready for action it's like what happened oh okay i can relax again Right. So the heart rate drops a lot quicker during the dive if you use ha a candle blows. Yes, it goes up quick and you can feel it going up quick, but it kind of disguises that demand that we have. Now, um, <clears throat> I think that's... Uh, I, I, as far as... I've got a list on the screen here and, and, and I've covered them. I've, I've kind of covered them all. Okay, so one other thing that people um, quite regularly ask me about is hyperventilation. Why is uh, why do we not consider uh, candle blows to be hyperventilation? And I simply answer, because they're not. Okay. The trouble comes, and you'll see a lot of stuff on Facebook from, uh, from uh, instructors and people who should 
frankly should know better, about hyperventilation. Hyperventilation, the word hyperventilation, overventilation, they interpret this as overbreathing, which is kind of true. So you'll see long discussions about whether if you extend your breathing, is this is hyperventilation. If you breathe quick and sharp, that's hyperventilation. But this is not true at all. Let me dispel that. The medical definition for hyperventilation, that's all we're interested in, is lowering the CO2 levels in the blood. Not in the lungs, not in the alveoli, but in the blood. Now, we've already said, I've already mentioned that the alveoli, uh, the, the CO2 levels in the alveoli, about 5%. And it goes up to 65 when we breathe slow. Okay? So you've got to reduce the CO2 levels in the alveoli, which takes quite a lot. Even to get it down a tiny bit takes quite a lot. But then you've got to keep it low in the alveoli long enough for it to start taking carbon dioxide out of the blood and it takes something like 20 to 30 seconds before we can even affect the co2 that we have in the blood so three candle blows is not hyperventilation it physically can't be because we at the very most gonna knock maybe one percent off one and a half percent off uh, the co2 levels in the alveoli at the very, very most, that is not going to instantly suck all the CO2 out of, out of the blood. It's just not going to happen. We've got to reduce the alveolic CO2 levels to maybe 3% to make any sort of difference. And then we've got to keep them at that. Don't forget, it's taking CO2 out of the blood, so we have to keep blowing off the carbon dioxide. Okay? So it takes 20, 30 seconds to even affect the carbon dioxide in the in the blood so um there is no it's uh, candle blows uh, uh, they are not anybody who even considers them uh, vaguely a possibility of being hyperventilation doesn't understand what hyperventilation is and why is hyperventilation so bad because the body needs carbon dioxide in the blood okay uh, and as soon as you start taking too much out or so yeah too much out then the the effects uh, can be quite uh, obvious you get claw finger you get tingling on the nose uh, you know there's this sort of stuff and this is this is co2 levels in the blood being very low okay so um uh, as i say there's um uh, a pdf that we can send to you uh, uh, just covering that but a couple of people ask so this is that's that's what it is three Deep breaths, diaphragmatic, forced breaths before our last breath to dive. Okay, and I think I've covered six or possibly seven of the reasons why. Okay, so <clears throat> the no tanks uh, aspect I'd like to cover today um, is uh, stressed breath hold. So uh, we have breath hold unstressed and stress hold breath hold. So the lazy tables are a perfect example of unstressed and the um, oxy walks <laughs> or some people know them as Pippin walks, although Pippin Ferreras, who they're named after, did not invent them at all. They were invented by Aaron Solomon. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, back in the 90s. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and they're a beautiful example of a stress breath hold, but they're also a beautiful example of a challenge, okay, and honesty, okay, and failure, okay, but really challenge because that's our word for tonight. So uh, the oxy walks, and that's your homework tonight, by the way, uh, partly to go and uh, watch a documentary about one of my heroes, Evil Knievel, who said positive mental attitude, and. Uh, and really embody the idea of failure uh, being the, when you don't get up rather than uh, just falling off. So um, Last of the Gladiators, I think, is quite a good uh, documentary about Evil Knievel. I mean, don't get me wrong, he was nuts. Um, but um, still a hero of mine. And you can see, yes, yes, that is his autograph. I have Evil Knievel's autograph. Anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, how I got that autograph of Evil Knievel is a completely different story for a different day. 
Um, so I'm going to talk you through uh, the Solomon walks because they're not the Pippin walks, Oxy walks. And this is your homework to do that. So very, very simple. Uh, and you can do it on your walk, your daily walk, your exercise walk. You can do. Um, you can even do it in the house if you want. If you want to go downstairs, that's absolutely fine. It works perfectly. Uh, <clears throat> although in the house there are sharp objects, and as with all breath hold activities, there is a possibility of blacking out. So wear a crash helmet. No, 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 no. Uh, just be careful and. Um, uh, you know, just have somebody around if if you are doing it on concrete or on the stairs, just in case you do black out. Um, although your housemates coming home and seeing you walking up down the stairs in a in a in a crash hat would be quite funny. So, uh, oxy walks. The full program we don't do in the club sessions just because uh, we're time limited and um, the scope of people doing it. But the full exercise is the following. Four breath holds. The first breath hold, sitting, doing a breath hold for one minute. A full lung breath hold. Now, most no tanks exercises, dry exercises, are done empty lung for safety and for convenience and to limit the, the targets and make the exercises harder. But the, the I keep calling them pipping walks, the oxy walks are done full lung. So, sit comfortably. Do your breathe up with one minute of breathe up. One minute. Only one minute of breathe up. Candle blows. One minute hold. And then while you're still holding your breath, you get up and you walk. Walk as far as you feel a challenge. All right. When you get to that challenge, stop. Put something on the floor, whether it's a fur cone or whether it's you know a brick or just see the car that you've you've got to, uh, you know, that you've walked next to or whatever it is. Okay, make a mark of what it is, and walk back slowly. Sit down, eyes closed. One minute, breathe up. Candle blows. One minute, hold. And get up, and walk. Your challenge is to go three paces further than the last one you did. Now you did the last one. It was you. Now. Don't do it the same way, the same place as you did the day before, or in the same location, or the same direction, okay? Because then you're going to be judging yourself against the person who did it yesterday, which is a different person, okay? You, today, with whatever you've eaten in, in your stomach, whatever, you know, things going on in your head, that's you today. So challenge yourself against yourself, okay? And you go three steps further, three paces further. Mark it, fur cone, or car, or put a stone down, or a twig, or something. Go back, sit down. Two minutes breathe up. Two minutes static. While still holding your breath after that static, get up and walk three paces further than you did before. Fourth one. Same again. Two minute breathe up. Two minute static. Then keep holding your breath. So it's on the same breath hold, get up, walk three paces further than you did on the last one. Sounds impossible, but it's not. It's a challenge. Of course, you can always change it around. You can do the first two a, a minute, uh, uh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, and then go up to a minute, if you feel that's that's your, what, you, what you're comfortable with. Or uh, a minute, a minute, one minute, 30, and then two minutes. That's my favorite. So it's a minute breath hold and then walk as far as you can. Minute breath hold, walk three paces further. A minute and a half, three paces further. Two minutes static and then walk three paces further. And when you've done that one, the, the things you'll learn are just incredible. At what point it's really easy. It can be the hardest breath hold ever. But as soon as you put your foot on the twig of the walk before, it's easy. Whoa, it's so easy. And you get like you get a, a kind of a, a kind of bonus three paces, and then it can be hard again, which is why you stop. Okay. Um, weird things like that go on, um, but of course, when you've done two minute breath hold and you walk three paces further than that, so that's uh, three, six. Now you've done like nearly ten paces more than you did on the first one with one minute breath hold. You go, well, what the heck was I doing on that first one? Well, there's lots of things going on, which I won't go into now. But uh, very interesting and very worthwhile doing. So that's your homework. Okay. So uh, Last of the Gladiators. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's on Netflix. 
I'm guessing it's not on Netflix. Um, and the um, Oxy Walks or the um, Solomon Walks. That'll do. So um, thanks to Aaron Solomon for uh, inventing so many things that we take for granted these days. Um, like the uh, tables A and B, O2 tables and CO2 tables, which I'll be talking about tomorrow and why they're not very good. Um, but I'll also be saying how we can make them better or what they're good for and what they're good for. So thank you very much. Uh, this session brought to you by the day of the word was challenge and uh, from the no tanks aspect stressed breath hold. Don't forget stressed breath hold can be stressed in the mind, can be stressed physically. They're both stressed breath holds. Okay, so thank you very much. Ciao, ciao.